Hi guys, it is another hot, hot January day in South Austin, Texas. I just finished my uh, weekly climate meltdown roundup uh, about one minute ago. And uh, this is my second climate change rant of the day on this heading close to 80 degree January day. Uh, this is a, my newest Bible for the apocalypse that I found right here in the uh, Austin, in the South Austin Library yesterday. And it, it's completely clear to me that I am the first person, the first person ever to crack the cover of this book. It was written three years ago. I don't know how long it's been in the uh, environmentally, uh, politically progressive town of Austin, Texas's library system, but I am the very first person in Austin, Texas to ever crack open this book from 2010. And this book is called Requiem for a Species. Why we resist the truth about climate change by a fellow named Clive Hamilton and uh, I'm, a, I'm a couple of uh, chapters into it. This is an excellent book that I highly recommend but judging by the fact that I am clearly the first person to ever open this book uh, that was written now three years ago by uh, the, uh, this chicken little Doomsday Prophet Clive Hamilton. What I am going to do is just read you the, uh, this excellent, excellent preface to the book. So if you don't want to drop everything you're doing and, uh, and, and get this book, I'm going to sit here and read this five-page preface, <clears throat> which, you know, he nails it. He just sums it up. Uh, and, and this and then the rest of the book is developing this theme. This is how he int introduces this book. And you know, I, I, I am just fascinated by this whole subject of climate change denial. Uh, how people, even intelligent people, uh, clearly intelligent people to this day, although it does seem to be finally that, that it's really taking the Alex Jones level uh, of denial and head up your ass uh, blindness to hold on to this, uh, to, to this ridiculous fallacy that, that climate change is not real. So I, I'm thrilled to report to Mr. Hamilton that, that things do, at least more and more Americans are pulling their heads out of their ass and understanding that that climate change is very well the big boo-boo, the, the big cosmic banana peel that is going to take this species and this planet down. And it's going to take this species and planet down a hell of a lot sooner than the, than the worst doomsday prophet chicken littles of only a few years ago were claiming. So this, these words were written three years ago by, uh, by, Mr., by Mr. Hamilton. So uh, here I go from here on out for anyone who wants to sit around and listen to me read to you. Okay. Sometimes facing up to the truth is just too hard. When the facts are distressing, it is easier to reframe or ignore them. Around the world, only a few have truly faced up to the facts about global warming. Apart from the climate skeptics, most people do not actually disbelieve what the climate scientists have been saying about the calamities expected to befall us all, but accepting intellectually, how many times have I had this rant, 
but accepting intellectually is not the same as accepting emotionally the possibility that the world as we know it is heading for a horrible end. It is the same with our own deaths. We all accept that we will die, but it is only when death is imminent that we confront the true meaning of our mortality. And uh, so now more and more we need to begin accepting uh, the deaths of the human species. The mortality of the human species and this planet is now in our face. Getting back to Mr. Hamilton. Over the last five years, now make this eight years, almost every advance in climate science has painted a, a more disturbing picture of the future. The reluctant conclusion of the most eminent climate scientists is that the world is now on a path to a very unpleasant future and it is already too late to stop it. it. It was too late to stop this freight train three years ago. Behind the facade of scientific detachment, the climate scientists themselves now evince a mood of barely suppressed panic. No one is willing to say publicly what the climate science is telling us. Bullshit, I'm right here on this rock. Have been, since this book was written, saying publicly what the climate science is telling us. That we can no longer prevent global warming. That will, this century, bring about a radically transformed world that is much more hostile to the survival and flourishing of life. As I will show, this is no longer an expectation of what might happen if we do not act soon. This will happen even if the most optimistic assessment of how the world might respond to the climate disruption is validated. The Copenhagen Conference in December 2009 was the last hope for humanity to pull back from the abyss. So of course this book was written well before that horse shit uh, charade going on over there uh, a few weeks ago in the end of 2012. Right. But a binding commitment from the major polluting nations to shift their economies immediately onto a path of rapid emission cuts proved too hard. In the light of the fierce, in light of the fierce urgency to act, there was a sense at Copenhagen that we were witnessing not so much the making of history, but the ending of it. And uh, nothing has changed since Copenhagen, between Copenhagen and his last round, except that every that we continue to put more and more and more and more of the of, of this shit into the air. We've put more and more into the air in 2012 than we did 2011, and we will put more in 2013 than we did 2012. Okay, back to uh, Mr. Hamilton. Some climate scientists feel guilty that they did not ring the alarm bells earlier so that we could have acted in time. But it's not their fault. As I will argue, and as the rest of this book he fleshes out, despite our pretensions to rationality, scientific facts are fighting against more powerful forces, meaning more powerful forces than scientific fact. Jesus. Apart from the institutional factors that have 
prevented early action, the power of industry, the rise of money politics, which is directly tied in to the power of industry. Where do you think the money is coming from to buy off these politicians? And bureaucratic inertia, we have never really believed the dire warnings of the climate scientists. Unreasoning optimism. How many times have I said this? Unreasoning optimism is one of humankind's greatest virtues and one of its most dangerous foibles. Oh boy. In the past, environmental warnings have often taken on an apocalyptic tone and it is to be expected that the public greets them with certain wariness. These damn environmental alarmists, these chicken little doomsday prophets, oh yeah, oh yeah. Yet climate change is unique among environmental threats because its risks have been systematically understated by both its campaigners and until very recently even most scientists. Environmental campaigners, naturally optimistic people have been slow to accept the full implications of the science and they worry about immobilizing the public with too much fear. With the growth of global greenhouse gas emissions now exceeding the worst case scenarios of only a few years ago and the expectation that we will soon pass tipping points that will trigger irreversible change to the climate, it is now apparent that the Cassandras, the global warming pessimists, are proving to be right and that the Pollyannas, which would be the global warming optimists, are wrong. Good Lord. There have been any number of books and reports over the years explaining just how ominous the future looks and how little time we have left to act. This book is about why we have ignored those warnings. This is a book about the frailties of the human species the perversity of our institutions and the psychological dispositions that have set us on a self-destructive path. The book is, this book is about our strange obsessions, our penchant for avoiding facts and especially our hubris. It is the story of a battle between us, I'm sorry, a battle within us between the forces that should have caused us to protect the earth. Our capacity to reason, our connection to nature, and those that in the end have won out our greed our materialism and our alienation from nature. And it is about the 21st century consequences of these failures. And I should probably stop here because I understand but for the one or two people left on this planet, I will go ahead and read through these last two pages. If you're not hearing enough already, Okay, for some years I could see intellectually that the gap between the actions demanded by the science and what our political institutions could deliver was large and probably unbridgeable, yet emotionally I could not accept what this really meant 
for the future of this planet. For me, it was May 2008. For this guy, uh, it was only in September of 2008 after reading a number of new books, reports, and scientific papers that I finally allowed myself to make the shift and to admit that we are simply not going to act with anything like the urgency required. Humanity's determination to transform our planet for its own material benefit, meaning humanity's own material benefit is now backfiring on us in the most spectacular way so that the climate crisis for the human species is now an existential crisis. On one level, I felt relief. Relief at finally being able to admit what my rational brain had been telling me. Relief at no longer having to spend energy on false hopes. Relief at being able to let go, to surrender, you know, there's all this shit, these bliss and he's talking about surrender, to let go of some of my anger at the politicians, business executives, and climate skeptics who are largely responsible for delaying action against global warming until it became too late. Yet capitulating to the truth initiated a period of turmoil that lasted as least as it long it took to write this book. So why write it? Exactly. It's the same reason that, you know, I agree with this guy. We are a bunch uh, of rats on a sinking ship. Why write your damn book, Clive? Why do I get up on your rock and rant every day when you're completely hopeless about the situation? Here is, here is Clive's answer. Accepting the reality of climate change does not mean we should do nothing. Cutting global emissions quickly and deeply can at least delay some of the worst effects of warming, but sooner or later we must face up to the truth and try to understand why we have allowed this situation that now confronts us. Apart from the need to understand how we arrived at this point, the main justification for this book is that by setting out what we face, we can better prepare ourselves for it. For to be able to prepare ourselves for what is to come. That's the best we can hope for, is to duck and cover. Undoubtedly, I will be accused of doom-mongering. Prophecies of doom have always been one of two types. Some, like those doomsday cults, uh, have been built on the belief in a truth, you know, by a supernatural force, uh, according to the delusions of a charismatic leader. And uh, we don't need to blab about that. The second type is based on the possibility of a real disaster, the one whose probability is exaggerated. And uh, so he talks about nuclear war and the Cold War, Y2K collisions with an asteroid and all of that stuff. Uh, until recently, catastrophic global warming fell into the latter category in anyone predicting the end of modern civilization was arguably guilty of exaggerating the known risks. Uh, but things are different in climate change. But in the last few years, scientists' predictions about climate change have become much more certain, much more alarming, with bigger and irreversible 
changes now expected sooner. After a decade of little action, even with a very optimistic assessment of the likelihood of the world taking the necessary action and in the absence of so-called unknown unknowns, catastrophic climate change is now virtually certain. In the last paragraph that I will read here, in these circumstances, refusing to accept that we face a very unpleasant future becomes perverse. Climate change denial requires a willful misreading of science, a romantic view of the ability of political institu institutions to respond to, you know, to the crisis, or faith in divine intervention. Climate Pollyannas adopt the same tactics as the doom mongers, but in reverse. Instead of taking a very small risk of disaster and exaggerating it, they take a very high risk of disaster and minimize it. And uh, that is what the rest of this book, which uh, is excellent, uh, highly recommended. I'll probably be referring to it in, in, in other rants over the next few days. Uh, but the preface says it all. Hallelujah to you, Mr. Clive Hamilton, a new one of my heroes, Requiem for a Species. Guys, this is it. We've done it. We've done it. But uh, for this January 23rd, bring it on. I absolutely love sitting out here barefooted in my pajamas and my Hawaiian shirt on January 23rd. And as far as the weather forecast can see, right up to Groundhog Day, I can expect more of this. So there you go. I love it. And with that, I will wrap up this rant because I got to head down and uh, fork over $1,700. $1,700 to the tax man to help. I wonder how much of my $1,700 I'm giving to the tax man is going into fighting climate change. Jesus. Bye, guys.